Okay. Thank you ever so much, and thank you for the invitation and for your patience. And uh, let me see one more thing. Do you see as well uh, my little video where it's supposed to be? Uh, That's all I right. I could just right. see a white slide at the moment. All right. If you see my slides, that is the uh, what matters. And thank you, everyone. And um, the, I titled this talk, Expanding the Role of HPC Centers on Training and Collaboration for Reproducibility. And um, I hope that this will be of relevance to those who are in the audience. And uh, I wanted to share that at SC20, only uh, last month, I think, <laughs> I was invited to speak about my work and insights on transparency and reproducibility in the context of HPC. The title of my talk was Trustworthy Computational Evidence Through Transparency and Reproducibility. You can find the recording of my talk in my YouTube channel. And uh, this was part of a session titled A Responsible Application of HPC. And here in this talk, I wanted to expand a little bit on how could teams at supercomputing facilities work with researchers to help them adopt better, better reproducibility practices. Um, so this talk will complement my SC20 invited talk, but focusing particularly in the role of HPC centers. I was also the SC19 reproducibility chair. Uh, I was the second person to hold that role for SC. The, the first person, Mike Haru at Sandia, served for the two years prior. And reproducibility as, at SC is uh, under the technical program, uh, which each year has escalated its requirements for authors. For example, the artifact description appendix is now required for all technical papers. And um, Last year, we standardized the appendix with a form, a, non, a web form that would ask authors to describe specific parts of their workflow, like any software, any data, or any digital artifacts that were associated with the research. Uh, authors had to state whether any artifacts were available, and if yes, they would provide a URL to access them. Uh, the standard form um, guided uh, authors to specify their environment, uh, filling relevant hardware details, operating system, uh, compiler versions, and so on, and uh, as well as key algorithms and software libraries that were utilized. The appendices are reviewed by a separate committee from the te technical uh, program committee, and this committee operates in an innovative double open model uh, where both the authors know who the reviewers are and vice versa, so that there can be a constructive conversation to assist authors in improving the quality of their uh, artifact descriptions. And um, uh, whereas, in contrast, the technical program operates in a double blind format. Uh, the conference also includes now a reproducibility challenge, which is a feature that is appearing more and more in other conferences. And the innovative double open peer review of appendices allows the committee to access the software, of course, uh, and other research objects to confirm that they're available and then constructively engage with the author so that they can, for example, uh, improve the way that um, access is provided. Often authors would um, provide, for example, a GitHub URL to a version control repository or even sometimes a um, uh, URL to a lab website, uh, but uh, we then guide the authors to understand that GitHub does not provide guarantee of persistence and therefore it's important to use an archival quality service such as Zenodo. Um, the fact is that while we adopt our methodologies in the benefit of transparency and reproducibility, researchers need advice. They need advice and they need technical support. And that was the purpose of this committee in the double open format. So I talked about Zenodo and I uh, want to highlight this because it is a, 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 one of the most used archives for open sharing of research objects, including software. Uh, as many of you know, Zenodo is an open access repository that is funded by the European Union's framework programs for research. It is operated by CERN, which is the largest high energy physics laboratory in the world. And so it hosts uh, some of the world's top experts in running large scale research data infrastructure at Zenodo. 
Uh, so they've built this service on top of infrastructure that they um, uh, have in the service of this very large high energy physics laboratory. It hosts any kind of data under any license type, including closed access, which is something people uh, sometimes do not know. Um, to be explicit with the meaning of reproducibility I use here, uh, I quote the uh, report by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, and that I was a member of the committee that, uh, that for uh, about uh, 18 months uh, met to uh, draft and study uh, this consensus um, report, uh, which was mandated by Congress, uh, by um, US federal law in, in, published in January 2017, then commissioned by the National Science Foundation to the National Academies. And the meaning, the definition there used for reproducibility is obtaining consistent results using the same input, data, computational steps, methods, code, and condition of analysis. And uh, so it is. it hinges on transparency, of course, to be able to do that. Um, now you may have not may have, may have missed because this was published only uh, on the first of December, and uh, the uh, European Union just released this report on reproducibility uh, of scientific results. It talks about a reproducibility continuum based on the three research processes of reproduction, replication, and reuse. And it states that all three processes rest on the availability of data and methods from the original study. Now it's important that uh, we note that both the National Academies report and these, uh, this new report from the European Commission uh, shy away from this narrative of a crisis because that's really not helpful. And uh, we do, we, we in the National Academies Committee as uh, did uh, consider, consider this very, very carefully. And even though one can speak of a lack of reproducibility or maybe you know, a, a, an aspiration for more reproducibility. It is not a crisis. We do have, uh, we do see, of course, the progress of science, and we uh, see trust in science uh, by the public. Um, but in the sense of the definition, uh, reproducibility hinges on transparency of the computational research meaning that the digital research objects that were used to produce the results eventually uh, are available or shared with, uh, with other researchers. Uh, the norm is for sharing to be preemptive. Uh, that is, um, digital objects are deposited in a persistent service at the time of pub publication, and you are able to cite a global identifier such as, such as a DOI. And increasingly, the alternative of data available upon request is now frowned upon, uh, and this is um, now developing as the standard. And even better is to um, share as well the software under a um, uh, open, a standard open source license, um, and to have the software under version control. And even better than that is to follow an open development model where users can open issues and develop and submit pull requests with code contributions being public, publicly credited. So in the context of HPC, however, you know, results can hardly ever be directly reproduced because by nature of the computing applications, the runs are costly, uh, they require allocations in large machines that go through a competitive process to be awarded. So one may ask, you know, what is the use of software and code being, uh, software and data being open if other researchers cannot really run the uh, experiments? What is uh, the point in HPC if other researchers really cannot exercise the machine um, and the digital objects of the research? Um, so it's important to know that projects, computational research projects are not born high performance, but rather grow over some years from code prototypes that are developed by graduate students to software collaborations to large scale projects. Reproducible research practices applied from the start of a project are more likely to lead to reproducible results at larger scales when the runs become too costly and are unique and um, perhaps the machine won't even be available after it's decommissioned. Now, 
it's key to note that most graduate programs offer no training on reproducible research. They hardly offer any training in software development or software engineering. And students, graduate students and postdocs pick up these skills, these skills through uh, informal learning. Uh, some research groups like mine have developed their own internal materials for onboarding uh, new members, but this is not the norm. I uh, give you two examples uh, there. And uh, when I post my slides, you will have an active link to those sources. So here's a proposal. As requirements for conducting research reproducibly are becoming more rigorous, HPC centers can serve a key role with educational programs in support of this. And um, of course, we know it has been traditional for supercomputing centers around the world to hold workshops and summer schools, focusing on skills and training related to parallel computing, um, uh, submission, uh, job submission systems, and in uh, you know um, advanced programming um, techniques. But in the current uh, uh, environment, with a now um, increase improved staffing, let's say, with career paths for research software engineers, for uh, even the UK has been uh, leading in this sense, I think um, we are uh, have an opportunity to support the research process and research teams in areas where formal education is, is, is lacking. Um, so let me point out uh, one recommendation that I want to highlight from the National Academies report on reproducibility. The report did include recommendations for various stakes, stakeholders, including researchers, journals and conferences, professional societies, academic institutions, you know, funding agencies. And one recommendation that can be adopted without imposing a large investment or deep, changing, deep changes in um, the grant application process is the recommendation 6.9, uh, where it says that researchers should discuss in their proposal how they will assess uncertainties and address reproducibility or replicability issues in their grant proposal. And it also says that funders should use reproducibility and replicability in, as one of the merit review criteria for evaluating grant proposals. So if agencies heed this recommendation, and we have uh, signs that increasingly they are uh, doing so, we will see some shifting policies, shifting science policy that embraces reproducibility and transparency in research. Now, for example, it, um, at Sandia National Laboratories, uh, Mike Haru, who is a senior scientist there, told me about uh, their internal calls for proposals, which are called laboratory directed research and development grants. And he explained to me recently, uh, just before uh, SC20, how they now, the, the calls for proposals now contain specific language asking proposers to talk about how their project will address transparency and reproducibility. And these aspects need to be discussed in the proposal, and they are indeed discussed by the reviewers, as, and they are a factor in the decision making. Making. So expectations are growing that good science cases also need to address reproducibility. And already some uh, teams at Sandia, Mike told me, are performing at a high level. For example, they produce artifact appendices uh, for every publication that they submit, regardless of the conference or journal requirements. And, and here's another uh, area where we could talk about expectations to discuss reproducibility and open research objects, uh, because the allocations for computing time, at least in the US, I don't know if you can tell me if in the UK as well, are uh, separate from the science grant. So you have to apply separately for computing time. And uh, John West from uh, the Texas Advanced uh, Computing Center and I were talking about this recently and um, bouncing ideas about how cyber infrastructure providers might play a role in growing adoption of reproducibility practices. Typical submissions discuss the research plan and resource request and uh, you know they go through intellectual narrative methodology, the research plan and so on. And um, interestingly though, the uh, award is not tied to performance. The allocation award is not tied to performance, uh, but rather researchers are asked to show that their codes can scale to the uh, machines. 
And so responsible stewardship of the supercomputing system is provided through a close collaboration between the PIs and the facility staff after the allocation is awarded through the process of improving their software uh, uh, to run in the machines. In addition, codes are instrumented under the hood with low overhead collection uh, of system-wide performance data. In the UT facility, this is called the tax stats. And um, there's a, some sort of web interface to produce reports. So I see three opportunities here. One is a workflow management uh, and or system monitory that could be extended to also supply automated provenance capture thereby uh, facilitating reproducibility um, and making this easier for researchers. Uh, two, the expert staff at the facility could broaden their support to researchers to include advice and training in transparency and reproducibility. Three, the cyber infrastructure facilities could expand their training initiatives to include the essential skills for reproducible research. Uh, John floated other ideas like possibly, you know, that some projects be offered a small bump in their allocation to engage in uh, reproducibility activities and, uh, and so on. So there are ways that we can think about um, how to incentivize a commitment and, a, and an increasing level of maturity in reproducibility for these projects that are using leadership facilities. Now, in HPC settings, really, we can hardly ever reproduce results, right? Um, so this is due to the machine access, the cost, the efforts. So we need a vigorous alignment of the goals of transparency and reproducibility um, uh, with a blend of incentives and norms. Um, we should consider especially applications that are of high consequence to society. So maybe the, the, the standards there should be higher. So if we're talking about climate modeling and um, uh, areas where it's going to impact directly some science policy, then we might increase our levels of, of, of transparency requirements uh, and, and public communication. Now, um, over time, we will arrive at a level of maturity that achieves this goal of trustworthy computational evidence, and um, maybe not by actually exercising the open research office objects, the code and data uh, that are shared by the authors, but by a research process that ensures um, what I'm calling now unimpeachable provenance of the research results. And uh, switching gears a little bit, I want to talk, so if I go back, I just said that uh, um, researchers need support and infrastructure. And in regards to infrastructure, I want to talk a little bit about, in particular, interactive computing. Because interactive computing is increasingly necessary for both research and education. The most rapidly growing ecosystem is that of Project Jupiter. That's an ecosystem of tools, open source tools for interactive and exploratory computing at the heart of which is the Jupyter Notebook. And um, the Jupyter Hub um, uh, tool allows serving Jupyter Notebook for multiple re remote users. And um, I've been using Jupyter in both my teaching and research for nearly a decade, for about eight years, I'd say. And um, uh, it, it's, it's become an essential tool. Now, let me tell you about an example here. This is Canada, uh, this is the Syzygy project, Canada's federated Jupiter hub, which is serving more than 20 universities. It is a project of the Pacific Institute for Mathematical Sciences, PIMS, and uh, Compute Canada, as well as Cybera. And Cybera is uh, Alberta's nonprofit organization for um, driving economic growth through the use of digital technology. Uh, Compute Canada provides uh, advanced research computing systems uh, for the nation's uh, research and innovation. And this project um, is really amazing because it offers a federated Jupiter hub that is serving um, across, the, across Canada research and educational institutions. And, uh, the, these universities all, you know, allow their, the, this service allows all of the faculty and staff at these universities to log in with single sign on from the university and access immediately uh, interactive computing in the cloud. Uh, this, the number of users so far uh, runs in, uh, in the numbers of 34, 35,000 by now. Another example I want to highlight is the Berkeley Data 8 project. Now, this is an educational project teaching data science to thousands of students. 
um, the, they provide an open infrastructure for a large scale introductory course in data science. It's a freshman course called Data 8. And with a shared computing infrastructure for all students, teaching assistants and so on, uh, they can build content and learning experiences that rely on the availability of these services. It also means that there's no need to provide technical support for a myriad devices with possibly dispar disparate um, environments. And uh, which, of course, would be prohibitive at large scales. And the learning content is prepared using Jupyter. Auto grading is provided for student assignments also using Jupyter. And this project has seen incredible success in teaching key skills to a large population of students. Now, data aid is possible because of an infrastructure that consists of an ecosystem of open tools. Jupyter Book for the textbook, Jupyter Hub for its online cloud-based interactive computing infrastructure, um, ready compute environments with all of the software that students might need, Python, Matplotlib, Pandas, NumPy, and so on, authentication with university login, open materials on GitHub, and custom tools to deliver that content automatically to students, um, and in addition to the, I already mentioned, auto-grading of assignments. Now, both Syzygy and um, the Berkeley Data Aid Project are really hard to achieve elsewhere at institutions. Uh, Berkeley is a large university that strategically allocated large funding for this initiative. It also has unique exper expertise with one of the Project Jupiter founders at uh, Berkeley and several of the core devs at uh, Berkeley. And, you know, Jupiter Hub consists of uh, subsystems like um, you know the hub itself which is a web application built on the open source um, tornado python framework a configurable http proxy that receives the request from the client's browser multiple single user jupyter notebooks servers that are monitored by, by spawners and um, an authentication class that manages how users can access the system so you know and ideally you want the single sign-on of the, you know, the institution to work here so all of this mumbo jumbo of technical terms already illuminates an essential problem. Serving Jupyter Hub for many users requires considerable expertise to configure, deploy, and develop. And this expertise is usually not available at universities. And you know, in fact, it, it it's it's they are skills that are in high demand in industry as well. So for the majority of educational institutions, deploying this infrastructure is really a non-starter, and this is a large barrier for adoption. And I want to say also that a fully open source stack should be preferable for universities to avoid vendor lock-in. And um, Jupyter has become the de facto environment for data science. There are, of course, startups that are popping up everywhere with software as a service solutions, and they do market to universities, but they're tailored to industry workflows and machine learning and AI, not really for research and education. The interfaces and the user experience are custom. They're not what students will see in plain Jupyter. And uh, it's important for educational institutions to have flexibility that, so that they can work with any cloud provider. So an open source stack means interoperability, flexibility, and which is best for research for many reasons. So the opportunity I see for HPC centers is to partner with universities regionally or nationally and expand the mission of the center to a wider sector of users by deploying and managing infrastructure in support of the research and educational missions. Jupyter and, data set up, data, and the PyData stack is now the standard environment used in data science and AI. It is also a wonderful environment for teaching, computing at all levels. And combined with a solid educational initiative facilitating access to all students, educators and researchers can really have a vast impact on raising the reach and the level of computational literacy. So the impact in the end can be as important as that of providing leadership computing infrastructure. And if you need evidence to back up the statement that Jupyter is the killer app, just look at this graph. This is the number of publicly visible Jupyter notebooks on GitHub. And you can see that it's reaching 10 million, 10 million public notebooks that are deposited on this one platform um, by the end of this year. And the um, predictions um, say it could reach 14 million by the end of next year. So it has been growing exponentially. You can find this analysis uh, up to date in this uh, GitHub repository. And indeed, 
I have a confidence saying that is uh, the de facto standard in data science. So this is the opportunity I wanted to highlight in this group, um, uh, thinking about a, a, a void that perhaps um, in the UK, the um, um, facilities, the computing facilities could be expanding to. And uh, with that, I would, uh, I think I left a couple of minutes for discussion if you are interested or, or have some questions. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Lorena. Thank you for a very nice talk. Um, so there's uh, one question from the Q&A. So we'll start with that. Um, so uh, Indulis Bernstein, uh, isn't there a problem with expecting reproducibility in all cases because some of the experimental equipment in high-end computing is unique because of its large scale? Is it sort of like asking CERN to reproduce the level of energy in the Large, uh, large Hadron Collider? Um, I would say I answered that question in my talk and um, uh, perhaps the question was uh, written before, before I went yeah. to, that, um, to that spot in the talk. Uh, in HPC, of course, in the HPC setting, we don't, ex we don't expect to exercise the software and data objects that are shared publicly by the research teams. What we expect is ar arriving at the level of maturity where you have access to HPC leadership computing through a history of applying reproducible research practices from the beginning of the project so that we can build confidence over time that uh, the research um, has um, solid provenance practices and data and software management practices. Thank you. Uh, so there's a question here from uh, Martin uh, Wolfton-Croft. Uh, do you have any suggestions for how to avoid students learning by rote? So if they suddenly don't have uh, Jupiter, they are lost. So uh, do you have any suggestions around kind of, I suppose, reducing dependence? Yeah, so I, I, I'll read it verbatim. Uh, so the question was, do you have any suggestions for how to avoid students learning by rote, e.g. if they suddenly don't have Jupiter, they are completely lost? Uh, that sounds like two questions. Um, the first question uh, about learning by rote. Um, well, in, in education, we uh, practice active learning uh, as a um, effective technique to achieve um, more uh, lasting and deep learning, deep learning. I'm, I'm talking about human learning, not machine learning. The, the terms are over, you know, are, are overloaded because of course there's active learning and there's deep learning in, in, the, in, in, in the field of AI. I'm talking about human um, cognition. Uh, by active learning, I mean, you know, using live coding, um, uh, having, uh, having uh, uh, lots of exercises, there are things that people have published in cognitive science. There's something called the worked example effect, which is a cognitive load theory uh, that allows one to uh, break down, that allows one to use effects that are um, uh, useful for novices, breaking down things into smaller chunks. Um, there are several techniques that are useful in the field of computer programming education, computer science education in particular, um, there's a whole conference dedicated to computing education. Um, uh, and so I want to say that uh, every dedicated teacher um, informs herself about those techniques so that students are not learning by rote and they're actually uh, deeply um, becoming more skilled and uh, uh, educated. The second question had to do about what happens when you no longer have Jupiter. Well, Jupiter is, an, is, is a tool to be used in a certain environment and that environment is, is interactive computing uh, where you are indeed um, um, iterating through a process where you use computing to in the aid of thinking, right? Now as, um, and, and, and you know, we have to understand that we need this type of skill to be widespread in the uh, new generation. We need this to be infrastructural in the sense uh, like 
you know, for engineering and science, calculus might be said to be infrastructural. We can rely on it in all of the advanced courses because everybody learns it, right? Once that happens, then we're going to have uh, some uh, transformation of, of the, um, the, the educational use of computing. But then of course, a smaller and smaller proportion of students will become more specialized and increasingly use other tools. And certainly Jupiter is not for everything, but um, uh, also, you know, uh, remote jo job submission systems and C++ and MPI programming is not for everybody. So similarly, you know, you have some people that will progress through uh, becoming specialized and professional uh, uh, scientific programmers. And for those people, we have informal training and formal training through the workshops, summer schools, and university courses that address high performance computing. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm conscious of the time. However, uh, th there's one more question, if you don't mind. Um, so this is from Aslan Gunra. Um, so he just said, in respect to reproducibility and replicability, should we not encourage papers to have a section on software and hardware environments? So, for example, version numbers, firmware, etc. Or is this just asking too much? Absolutely, I agree with you. And this is the, what has been developed at the supercomputing conference. What we call the artifact description appendix is precisely that. And as I was mentioning, in some uh, groups, like is the Santia National Laboratory, um, this has become the norm, even when the conference or the journal does not require it. And um, I, I think you will see increasingly conferences like ACM conferences, um, uh, adding this type of um, either optional or mandatory requirements for articles to include, for papers to include uh, either an appendix or a section in the paper that addresses precisely that. Um, uh, Increasingly, this can move to some metadata that could be machine readable and, and that could be analyzed and so forth. But I certainly I see a shifting of this overall norms um, in, in, in our field and this, there will be a science policy to go with it um, that will be requiring this kind of documentation of, of the computational research workflow. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for an incredibly interesting talk. Um, and I think it's an incredibly important topic and hopefully one that the audience here today has appreciated. Uh, Thanks very so, much for the invitation. Thank you.